Wait, it says provide the recording ID. Just put one in. This conference is being recorded. Yep. Well, welcome. Uh, this is John MacArthur. I'm here at uh, at Wikibon headquarters. Uh, I am John MacArthur, and I am the moderator for today's Peer Insight. Um, we are here today uh, with Brigham Hyde, who's an adjunct professor at Tufts University, and he's now managing director of Relay, Te Relay Technology Management. Um, uh, Brigham has worked in drug development and investment banking, and, um, has, and has now moved to a managing director at Relay. We're also joined by Sid uh, uh, Probstein, CTO of Ativio, uh, and Jeff Kelly, who is Wikibon's big data analyst. And we're here today to talk about combining unstructured and structured, structured data for delivering big data business value. So Brigham, let me kick it off with you and just to ask you, you, came for, you, have, you have an interesting background, having, you, you have your doctorate in pharmacology. pharmacology. You've worked, you're working as an adjunct professor, you've done investment banking, and now you're at Relay. Tell us about that journey and a little bit about what you're doing. The idea of Relay actually in, in 2008, myself and uh, the other co-founder, David Greenwald, who's a PhD in genetics, and looking at um, drug development and the challenges in terms of data overload and analysis that they faced. Um, we were both frustrated uh, scientific entrepreneurs trying to get ideas out of the lab, trying to understand a bit more about how the marketplace uh, worked for those decisions, and I think realized very quickly that uh, the people making those decisions, high-risk decisions, were very um, underserved in terms of uh, access to data and meaningful insight from that data. Um, and we set out to create Relay kind of on that principle. And, uh, my experience in banking, uh, in the meantime, confirmed a lot of that from the other side. So, you know, having to analyze those companies and those uh, drug development assets, for instance, and realizing that it was a highly qualitative process in some ways, uh, with a lot of information to pour over, which was largely being done on a manual basis. I mean, I lived in the spreadsheet world, you know, and, and manually curated data for a long time. So. Um, really wanted to get at those issues and, and stepped into big data to do it. What are some of the kinds of data that, that, that the scientists didn't have access to, that they need access to, in order to make more informed decisions? Well, just to give you an example, uh, let's say I'm looking at a uh, phase two drug development asset. And you think about the attributes of that asset that are important. There's certainly commercial aspects such as, you know, uh, transactional information about it or uh, how much I paid for it or how much the market size is. That's all uh, out there. I think the interesting thing is to then connect that to the scientific and clinical information. So while it's great to say I have an asset for colorectal cancer, it's another thing to understand the underlying science of that asset and the information that's out there that could be mined to determine is it more or less likely to work. Um, is the clinical data there to support uh, affording of, of, of the asset and what other regulatory agencies respond to it? And the connection of that data, I think, is really one of the crucial things Relay has done, uh, enabled under the covers by the ability to unify many different types of data. Um, so structured on structure, we'll talk about that. But just simply finding a way to get this thing into one place and then ask it directed questions that made sense to users. Do you know what questions you want to ask? Or do the investors know what questions they want to ask? You know, it's interesting. I, I think um, we have a lot of engineering talent at Relay, and our CTO is former CTO of Elsevier, Mark Krellenstein, uh, a guy who founded Northern Light, you know, 15 years ago, and one of the early search companies. So we have a lot of engineering talent. I think what makes Relay unique is that we have you know, folks like myself people with uh, experience in biology, pharmacology, and also in business to understand what the question we're trying to ask of the data is. Um, and I think that's why we've taken on the approach of developing a SaaS product, because we actually know some of the questions and can put together uh, those linked concepts. 
Um, and I think that's maybe where we differ from some pure technology plays and why we're a bit unique. Um, the users themselves that we interact with are business development folks. So this is maybe an MD, MBA or a PhD at a high business level. They might know the information they want, but they don't really know where to get it from and are largely living in the world of being served by databases where you download a CSV and then have to churn information. They may go to 20 independent data sources internally and externally to get information. So there's no kind of unified process and no way to kind of connect the dots between those efforts. And it's, it's I mean, our product competes with manual data curation. There's no question, uh, which is boggles my mind sometimes, but you know, that's, that's the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, Brigham, so we're talking about, it sounds like more than just structured data, of course, this is, this is a lot of unstructured content, it's documents, and talk a little bit about the types of data assets you're talking, we're trying to connect here, because um, it's one thing to kind of bring together disparate data sets if they're structured data. Right. Uh, it's a much different thing if it's unstructured content or multi-structured content, so talk about that. Yeah, and I, it's maybe worth talking about how we started technologically. I mean, we, we started in a SQL database at one point. That was the basis of, of Relay in the early days, and I think we immediately realized that we were leaving out and, and unable to really handle lots of big data sets, for instance, the scientific literature. You know, handling that and, and from a text mining and natural language perspective in a relational database just doesn't really work. Totally unscalable. Not to mention, if I try and connect that to something like uh, SEC documents, mm -hmm. you know, there's no natural connection there. So uh, we looked at it as, okay, what's important here? Importance is ontologies, an ontologic search first, and then, you know, exploratory and creative search, free text search and things like that. And so we wanted to find ways to actually connect the dots between those. We do it with our ontologies, but also uh, by partnering with Ativio under the covers, which enables us to actually make those connections really seamlessly and scalably. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we thought about moving off of a relational database, what we wanted to do was build for the problem we had today, but also say, we know there's going to be, you know, data's going up and to the right. You know, transparency's going up and to the right. We're going to need to be able to connect these dots long term and, and put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. For, for those who aren't um, uh, scientists and, 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 and drug discovery folks, uh, yeah. you, uh, describe what you mean by ontology. Yeah, so and in particular in this world of life science, ontologies are massively important. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, if I'm uh, talking about a disease and I'm talking about uh, lung cancer, it sounds like one thing. It's not one thing. There's small cell lung cancer. There's non-small cell. There's different stages. You would also call certain types of lung cancer solid tumors because it's a tumor type. So understanding ontologically that those things are connected and you know, being able to then relate them across relational databases and document sets into one you know, common entity is really the crucial piece. So we spend a lot of our time, we have right now uh, internally um, nine custom ontologies that we use that range from things like diseases to genes to drugs to uh, research topics, to people, um, you know, throughout journals and into business terms. Because I think the other big thing for our users is being able to leverage scientific information to make business decisions. So understanding the risk associated with uh, a given disease pathway and factoring that into their commercial decision about, hey, there's these M&A opportunities in front of me. So we try and connect those dots using ontologies. Well, well, maybe we could dig into the technology a little bit. So sure. uh, take us through your journey kind of from that from the relational database days to where you are today and kind of some of the underlying technologies that are using, you're using to actually uh, sure. kind of connect all these uh, unstructured uh, pieces of content. Yeah, so in the, in the relational database world, or our ye old database as we call it, <laughs> um, you know, we had, we, we were constantly fighting the ontology problem. Also, anytime we tried to add a new database, we were adding complexity and there would always be kind of gain and loss every time we did something. And I think we wanted to solve the immediate problem first, which was let's flatten it out, let's get everything in there and connect it, have the connecting uh, or the common connection be the ontologies kind of sitting on top. So that led us towards more of an index-based system, but we didn't want to lose the capability of being able to ask relational questions and structure data when it was appropriate, either for uh, purpose or for speed. So we wanted to kind of play in both worlds, and uh, we were lucky enough to get connected with uh, Sid and the guys over to Tibia. I remember our first uh, meeting, you know, Sid kind of drawing on a whiteboard and me going, you can do that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was an eye-opener for me. And we examined a couple of technology companies, 
Um, but ultimately, you know, it was clear that they could solve our immediate problem with the databases we had and without us losing anything. There were no real trade-offs at the get-go. And then long term, you know, creating a scalable data operation was very obvious and scalable in two ways, both in terms of the size of data. You know, we constantly push on, you know, the size of the database that we can and constantly advancing that. And we expect more data in the future. I mean, you talk about uh, long road, talk about medical records or talk about any of this stuff, which we're not in that world yet, but we may be someday. You know, you have to have a uh, scale of size and performance, but also scale in terms of data types. So the ability in the future to connect to, um, you know, Oracle databases, Hadoop, you know, whatever it might be long term, you know, those things were needed to be part of the roadmap. So we definitely considered that when, when evaluating and ultimately chose Tibio for a lot of those exact reasons. Uh, so Sid, uh, tell us, so uh, Sid uh, Probstein, again, the uh, CTO of uh, Tibio, um, tell us about that first meeting and sort of what you brought to the table when, when, when you met with Brigham. Well, I'll tell you, it was, uh, it was a great experience because so they were part of a, a big uh, mass high-tech uh, kind of startup um, boot camp lot slash of, lot Survivor of money, Island. A lot right? of money flown into, uh, into, into pharmaceuticals that's right. here in, in Massachusetts. Uh, well, Mass right? Challenge, i got to give mass, them a mass plug. Challenge. We were yeah, uh, a first-year right. finalist. So oh, okay. That was one of our ones and we got connected. The reason, I'm sure, the reason that they were a finalist is because you look at what they did, it's so incredibly exciting. It's the convergence of the things that I believe are going to drive our economy. And I say that kind of, it's kind of a big statement. I actually really believe it will drive the economy to no small degree for you know, years, decades, it's hard to say. But look at what they put together, right? Investment background, so they understand the process of funding these things. They have the, obviously, PhDs in the, in, in the actual science, right? So they understand the, the technology, the capabilities, all the different aspects of it. But they also thought about what, what does, this, does the decision maker who's trying to get from point A to point D, right, it's a longer journey in pharma, how are they going to get there? Well, in the old days, they would have, you know, said we want to look at this drug or this drug could you evaluate this element from a phase two versus another one from a phase two. And scientists would get together and they would do a couple things. One, they would have a spreadsheet, right? right? And they would also have typically a taxonomy on disk, probably a bunch of folders that they hand built, right, with different interesting description names, like this one describes the mechanism, this one describes the interactions, this one's, and then they would pile PDFs into those documents. And then they would, as a scientist, an eminent, you know, MD, make a decision, right? Yep. And that's what they would drive the decision. Now the problem is that model worked great, but now we're awash in data. There's far too much data for us to easily consume in that model. More PDFs than we could possibly, you know, organize into our hand taxonomy. Plus you have these huge data sets, right? All of this massive amount of, you know, observation data, sensor data that's being recorded. Putting them together, any one silo is interesting. It's putting them together, yeah. that's where you get the spark that leads to that kind of amazing return. And essentially, you know, when I walked in, the first time I met with these guys, they had all of the pieces except the information access layer. They had a database with these different parts of data hand curated, put together. And the problem was it wasn't a great demo, right? It was, you have to start by pull, doing a big pull down list and navigating down, again, typical database stuff. Yep. And they said, look, we need something that's much more the way the world information works on the web, right? We want kind of a search box, but it's not just search, right? Because we also have to show this aggregate information. The whole point is to take some concept like, you know, whatever that, elements of that phase two clinical trial is and say, I want to understand the value of this in context with all other things across all the other silos. So, okay, so said, we're, we're, we did it for them. That, that was the key thing. We were able yeah, to take yeah. that, preserve the structured data, the relationships between it, do full text search, but then also support SQL so they can use Tibco Spotfire, right, right, to do incredible visualizations. Yes, and that brought, brought the data to life. So we're here to talk about uh, delivering business value. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so give me the business value angle on this. What, what we're, we're making better decisions, we're making, what's the return to the investor, what's the in return to the drug company? Yeah, so a couple of unique things that um, Relay can do, and I'll, I'll give you kind of three brief cases, because I think it's, it's useful to describe. You know, a common uh, job of somebody who's in BD, who's our main client right now, you know, is they get tasked, okay, uh, we need to be in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, you need to go find what's coming up in Alzheimer's disease, and, uh, and make an acquisition, and make a business case for that acquisition, but also understand where we are with the scientific case. And they'll go out, and, and there are databases out there that they can download spreadsheets of these are the companies with these assets, but they're not getting the information on, for instance, a mechanism. So for, you know, 
right now you might say uh, you know a hot uh, target is you know PI3 kinase or in, in Alzheimer's uh, might be Parkin or something like that. Well, these are genes, by the way, that I'm mentioning. Um, we can detect the historical trends and the underlying data that it could have told you last year this is going to be the hot thing next year. And we actually take the step on the analytics and algorithm side to actually factor that into evaluation of an asset. So we have this thing called RVI, which is a relative value index, which is our attempt at making a stock market for a drug development assets. So if I'm comparing two phase two drugs, I can factor in the underlying information and the trends behind it and understand that this one's maybe a bit better than that one or this one's increasing faster. You can ask different questions of it, but it's engaging you know, kind of the raw data to give you a quantitative piece back to measure on. And on a sophisticated level, we actually factor it into valuation. So we can actually write a model that can say, based on this RVI, it's worth X more dollars or X less dollars, which is a real tangible uh, thing for people. I think the other part of it is that, you know, you're engaging something with live information. So as something changes, you know, you can actually get that change. Um, and, and see and be alerted when like, you know, some, some big paper was published or somebody uh, presented at a conference which totally changes the game, you know, for your world and now you can understand it. And it's that being current that I think is really valuable to folks. Right now, this is a very episodic thing. Think of the Alzheimer's case. I'm probably going to put my uh, three younger analysts on this for two months. They're going to spend a bunch of time churning data. We might get to an answer and the day that you get that answer, it's stale. And it's, you know, you lose the value you just created, you'll have to do it again. And I think uh, that's a big component. One other big piece we focus on, just to give you a use case, is around uh, KOLs. And one of the things that struck me... KOLs. Uh, sorry, uh, knowledge leaders. So in science, you know, there'll be a top researcher who's a major influencer in a field. And if you're in biopharma, there's a couple worlds here. You may uh, want to partner with them because they're inventing the next therapy for whatever disease. You may uh, want to fund some of their research because, you know, you just want to be with the smart guys. They also may be an influencer both at the FDA or in clinical adoption. So identifying who those guys are is really, really important. And we can actually track individuals and measure things about them that... Uh, infer value and can ask specific data, quantitative data questions of them um, and, and identify kind of who should be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so talk about, uh, you know, really, let's boil this down to real, the business value in terms of, is it making better decisions? Is it making more decisions, uh, faster decisions, um, more accurate decisions? What, what really are the main, main benefits here? Uh, the main benefit is, you know, on the asset side, you can make a better decision. I mean, you're getting they don't have access to the, the trend information at all in a quantitative way. Mm -hmm. So they may, you know, understand intuitively that it's there, but nobody's ever said, yep, that's the number that correlates to the right. thing you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. So by having that information at your fingertips, you can make that decision earlier. It provides an evidence base that enables you to leap over the wall of, yes, let's do this, mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting for consensus to get there and then being too late. Mm -hmm. In pharma, by the way, venture tends to be on the cutting edge. It now enables the pharmas to be venture-like in that they don't, you know, they're at the cutting edge of what's going on, which I think is really attractive to them because then they can pay a little less for an asset earlier than they would have waited and paid, you know, God knows what for it later. Uh, so there's definitely value there. I think the other is in terms of the time that they spend or what they spend doing with their time. So if the analysis is already done and updating at their desktop, they spend more time worrying about the kind of the narrowed group of information, a narrowed group of uh, assets, targets, mechanisms that are of interest. Instead of, you know, spending their time dragging data down and manually curating, you have the smart guys with the experience really focused on making a good decision as opposed to, you know, just getting the, to the answer. And for, we're trying to make that leap. For the people that just, uh, for the people that just joined us online or on the call, uh, just a reminder, we're here with Brigham Hyde, who's adjunct professor at uh, Tufts University and a managing director at Relay Technology Management and with, and with Sid Probstein, CTO of Ativio, um, and Jeff Kelly, Wikibon's big data analyst. We're talking about how to combine structured and unstructured data to deliver business value. Um, and we've been talking a lot in the pharma uh, space. I want to open up the, um, uh, the, to the audience to see if there are any questions that, that they have. We've got uh, quite a large number of people online here. So if someone has a question, let me pause for a second. Uh, good morning. This is David Sawyer. Um, I've got a, a, a question uh, that I uh, 
like uh, your opinion on. Well, what are the what are the how do you see the provision of data going forward? Well, what are the sources of that data? Uh, is it um, government data? Is it uh, uh, data collected by uh, data providers? Uh, Google? What, what what are the sources of data? How do you? Sid, why don't you why don't you yeah. talk about that? Because you're in more areas than pharma, obviously. I think the, as I was uh, alluding to earlier, the business value is not so much by creating intelligence inside one silo, by, but by creating intelligence across silos, right? And that's what really, really does. They let you look at so many sources. So I believe that companies will find more and more innovative ways to create value or opportunities for themselves <coughs> by bringing together more and more data. And it's going to be everything. It's going to be public sources. You're going to be, see licensing sources. I think there are already multiple efforts to create uh, kind of exchanges uh, around data, right? And, and create markets yeah. for data. So that's, that's all going to feed into it. And I think essentially what the, the lesson and I think the pattern that you can follow from, from what Relay is doing is the insight is about across the data and putting, how powerful is it? Again, look back, what was it, that discussion like five years ago inside Big Pharma, right? It's a bunch of doctors, each with their own viewpoints and experiences, taking as much data as they can consume and trying to make a data, uh, some kind of decision. And of course, that brings you quickly to opinions and round tables and delay, exactly as Brigham said, right? So if you can put a number around that stuff, but actually have that number be meaningful and trusted and be able to show, hey, it maps to all these different data sources. Some which are internal, yes, we could agree those are biased, but there are external sources that validate it, right? By creating that linkage. So the, the answer is data from everywhere. It's going to be, we're, we're washing data today, we're talking about big data, wait a couple of years. Right? Think of the number of sensors that are putting out observations right now. When that stuff starts to get spooled up and stored, we're, we're never going to see the end of it. And scalability is it's not a um, nice to have, it's a, a right to play. If you can't handle these volumes and, and make these connections, I think the, the future leaves you by. Mm -hmm. Let me follow on can, Sid's can, comments. Can I just follow, uh, follow that up a little Please. bit? The, the, you're implying this huge amounts of data, and I agree with you entirely. That'll be impossible to bring all of that together in one place. Uh, how would you, how would you, just, just from the point of view of physics of, of, of sending that data, how would you see that being dealt with uh, in the future? Um, are you going to uh, extract from different locations? Do we need to analyze in place and then yeah. pull? Probably. So the scale of things will, in time, put real pressure on all the different parts of the computing, you know, the infrastructure that, that uh, is needed to do this. But that's why cloud, right? This the entire cloud model, cloud computing has emerged, and the idea that hey, um, I can rent time, I can spin up a large number of servers. Maybe I really need a huge number, but I only need it for a few days to crunch through some massive data set to get insight, and then I can have it shrink back down to a more normal data set. Uh, I think that, you know, the distribution of the problem is definitely the future. Now, uh, today, for example, Atibio, our active intelligence engine, is essentially it's a sharded or distributed repository or an engine. Uh, you can put any kind of information in, and you can distribute it across lots and lots of servers. Uh, you guys are using Amazon servers for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, many different cloud configurations are possible, and you can spin up a couple of new ones as you need them to bring in more data. So I don't. I'm, it's not unique to Atibio. What I'm telling you is, I the answer to that question is really the distribution of the problem, right? Is and the interconnection of everything and the ability to access and federate. Those things are happening now, and uh, as more and more providers get into that world, you know, it'll it'll become easier to do. Yeah, let me answer this question from and both sides of it from a little bit perspective. I'm a data buyer and an, a, and an analysis creator, right, or a metadata creator. You know, that's essentially what Relay does, and I spend about a third of my time just shopping data sets. So on your first question, which I think is a really important one, which is where is the data? Mm -hmm. um, you know, government is some of it. I think, you know, ultimately, there's going to be this kind of secondary market of trading analysis. So um, look at what's happening with, uh, with Thomson Reuters right now, with LexisNexis. I mean, they're selling raw data. Sure, you can download a stream of their data, but they're beginning to sell metadata and analysis of that, so tagging. And so I could see a world in which you know, people take their own internal data sets and maybe I buy a specific analysis of it. So I want to know temporally, give me the tags for each company and when they announce a certain type of thing. 
and I might buy that instead of downloading the entire LexisNexis data set and asking it a question. And I, by the way, as a data seller, look at potentially that being a model for us. I know that people in my marketplace and SaaS are beginning to be asked for APIs to their analysis of a data set. So you might have somebody who's, like us, is trying to answer a specific question, taking certain data sets, unifying them, scaling them, making them live and updating, and then selling my answer to a certain question off of that data set. So I think there's going to be a couple different roles to play and add to that the companies which have their own internal data that they all need to deal with. So I, I think Sid, it'll be a merge of that. Sid, I'm interested in your perspective on this question of how fast does someone have to react to new information and particularly in the world of unstructured data. We had, we had uh, someone on recently um, on, on the Cube um, who were discussing uh, if you if it, if I analyze the data in a half an hour after the data was created, I've I've lost a quarter of a million dollars. Um, mm -hmm. It was in the casino world, right? So yep. you know, uh, how how do you see that impacting you know the customer set that you're serving? Well, to be honest, a lot of the um, advantages people are creating for themselves in the market are now done through speed, right? I can take some analysis that I do. I did it every week. I did it every month, it was fine. The volume of shopping has gone up, right? I have more of an e-channel e now to let people in, so I have more data coming in, and now I find if I can process the data faster, I can create a, a window during which I monetize whatever insight it is that I'm getting a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And that's very, I mean, that's just a real, again, a very real world um, phenomenon. You know, obviously in financial markets, uh, one of my banking clients said something like, you know, if we can get 1% more insight, that's enough to trade on, right, for one second because I can make a trade in 100 milliseconds or something like that. Right. So speed is, it, but it's all part of a continuum. There are many questions that can be answered slowly. And often those answers are the ones that you then could cook up with other answers, other parts of the puzzle, but that you need to do more, more frequently. And the entire equation changes and becomes interesting when one of those changes dramatically, right? Suddenly it skews everything off. And uh, that's actually the point of the sort of timeliness and the incremental update. I think it's much more powerful in unstructured because we're not used to it, right? Think of those MDs sitting around the table, they make the decision, they make the right decision, and the company marches on. But they miss, you know, two small updates that would have changed everything because they were unstructured, you know, they were press releases or law buried in a journal somewhere, they didn't pick up on it. So systems like Relay Tech Management, that's going to solve that for them and say, hey, come back, revisit this decision. Most companies are not so good at doing that, so, but I think that's going to be an emerging skill, right? Remembering why we made that decision, what data it was based on, and then understanding now what do we need to adjust, and being able to track every, every decision and say, are we still on point for this? Right. Versus the old model, which is, well, we put X million dollars and Y people into it and discovered it was the wrong approach, and so, you know, but we did three of those, so we, we arbitraged it effectively, right? Now you, maybe you could start two ventures based on that, you know, much more detailed and much more thorough analysis. Let me anecdotal. John. Go ahead. Hello, John. This yes. Is John Furrier. Hey, John. How you doing? Hey, I have a question for Sid and the folks on the panel there. Um, you know, obviously we love Hadoop. There's a lot of uh, conversations around a uh, blog post on GigaOM about Hadoop's days are numbered. And uh, are you guys been following uh, Google? Google's demo product and percolator. And the, and the thesis was is that Hadoop is too hard to use and might not stay around much longer. Um, do you have an opinion on that? And, and uh, how do you see the whole Hadoop ecosystem evolving given Google's recent public uh, disclosure of Dremel and Percolator? Well, I'm not sure I would count on Google as an authority over data analysis, to, to be honest. They, what they do is pretty unusual. Uh, in the sense that they focus really heavily on web pages in the public web, and it's a very interesting application. Um, I think Hadoop has a role to play. It is pretty much synonymous with big data, but it's a little bit of an error. People think of big data as being all about volume. It's not. There's more to it. Um, you know, you could look at it as volume and variety and uh, velocity, which we were talking about earlier, right? So you have many different aspects. Uh, Hadoop is great at dealing with the volume aspect, where I have, let's say, I track every click to my website, and this produces billions of observations every day. These observations individually are worthless. Uh, not really, they're, they're not worthless, but you wouldn't be interested, you wouldn't have a company meeting over the fact that, you know, Sid Probstein requested a, a size, you know, image of size 50, my logo image from the web server. It's not relevant. What you want to know is, okay, which parts of my site did Sid visit? And maybe Sid isn't interesting, but I want to know across all the people, or maybe an audience, one segment of my audience, right, which site, sites they went to. So you take that low item value data and you feed that through a system like Hadoop. 
and there are many others too, but Hadoop is the one that seems to be very popular. And you produce high value summary records, right? This is an analysis. Those billions of records now became a handful of records which tells me which of my website sections or properties were most popular, and I could even segment it further by audience. That's very valuable insight, but the truth of the matter is we've been doing that kind of analytics for a long time, decades. For one thing, we haven't had the huge volumes that e-commerce systems can now produce, right? So we haven't had to deal with that much data, but even more than that, you know, the insight was kind of there. We were able to basically take it far enough. Um, but it's still within one silo. Hadoop solves the problem of massive volume in a silo we already understand. But Hadoop alone, once it produces that data, it's still a silo. And the, again, the beauty of something like a relay tech management is you take that output, it's one piece of the puzzle, and the value is when I put the data all together and look across it. Yes, I want to understand the website popularity, but I also want the internal view, the internal data set, the public company survey, the public end user survey, um, all of the analyst reports, all the email back and forth between our two companies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the more of those, and the more you can boil that into a score. Wow. All right. Yeah. yeah. From an architecture follow standpoint, with it. Follow up on that. Yeah. Uh, can you also you share with me your. Uh, your angle on all the developments around machine learning it was a conference right. uh, just, just yesterday in San Francisco, Graph Lab, and hmm. it's, it's very complicated around all the different graph architectures and the data having a graph uh, format. Uh, but machine learning seems to be at the heart of that. So, you know, yeah. you mentioned ontologies earlier. Machine learning is, has been around for a while as well. Uh, ontology. How is that? How is machine learning changing the landscape? It's another great question. You know, I, I think machine learning brings a little bit of the machine intelligence to it. So earlier I talked about how you know, Relay kind of curated the set of data. Um, one of the things that brilliant people with a lot of domain experience do when they look at data, right, is they, 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 they realize things, they understand things, and they may want to tag the data, right? They may want to, um, they, may, they may identify separations or divisions or outcomes from the data that they think are strong. The problem very often then is to take that and generalize it. And um, you know, technologists who are listening on the phone, how, how long have you spent trying to tune an algorithm or tweak an algorithm to deal with the fact that you have far too little data to really reflect the problem? And, and frankly, in, in structured data, that's much less of a problem. When you start looking at unstructured data analysis, you need a lot of data, a lot of it, to really get the algorithm to do something like identify the concept for any document on the internet. Right? That takes a lot of data. And it's an advantage, you know, frankly, on the web that there is all that data. Machine learning is that tool, is the tool you use to do that. So when Brigham can say, hey, you know, connecting dot ABC, this is a good pattern, uh, it can now use a machine learning engine to identify what are the kind of features and patterns that are present in that, and then say, make decisions based on that, right? And find all of the other examples. So find me all the other ABCs, not this one, but the ones that are like it, right? The same kind of effect. Um, that's what machine learning is great for. I, I can tell you that, you know, at Ativia, we've been a long time believers in machine learning. Uh, we've brought all the different uh, approaches together, whether it's language modeling to do things like key phrase extraction, which gives you the really good concepts or terms inside a document, whether it's our, you know, cla machine learning classifier, whether it's our sentiment analyzer. These tools allow you to pick an outcome and then find all the others. And that's what I think, that's why it's important because it lets you find an example in data and then find all the others like Yeah, it. and we, we use it today. Um, you know, I mentioned the RBI score before the index. I mean, that is fed by machine learning. Now, I will make the point that in my world or at the edge I'm at, there's kind of hypothesis-driven and non-hypothesis-driven approaches. And, uh, you know, the non-hypothesis-driven is kind of the purest machine learning. And we have tools out of the box in the Tibio we can use to do that. Just draw connections on these data sets and use them to feed, you know, certain answers. And, and we, you know, we do explore those parts of it when we're asking kind of an open question. But a lot of time for high-end users or people who really need business intelligence, you need a very targeted question. You're going in with some concept or framework of the question you're going to ask, and we create a lot of these kind of secondary variables and secondary outcomes to measure that we then machine learn specific things against. So, so, so the difference, so the difference would be between asking the question, "What should I invest in?" versus "Should I invest in this?" Well, take, let me give you an right? example. Like, what if it says uh, we run machine learning and it determines that the cure for cancer is vitamin A? Right, that's not really an answer that's meaningful to our users. What would be meaningful is if I can constrain certain parts of it to say, 
consider, you know, ones that have not been FDA approved and not generic, consider like, you know, mechanisms that are related to that. So consider patent aspects that look like this. So by training that set and kind of targeting it, then you open up the power of machine learning and you can actually drive to a meaningful answer as opposed to kind of data against the wall, see what sticks. And, and this is where you get into things like causal inference modeling, markup chains, everything else. I think there'll be a lot of sophistication, particularly in life science emerging in that. And, and big data healthcare, quite frankly, in the next five, 10 years. So, um, you know, that's where it's going. You have to be able to have that skill set, both on the broad data set and also in a targeted way to get to real meaning, I think. So I wonder if we could switch gears a little bit to like some of the cultural considerations. Uh, you know, you talked about, you know, we talked before the call a little bit about, um, you know, some, some of the people in your industry not having very much quantifiable data. Uh, making decisions based on either you know, taking a long time to, to develop uh, their decision-making process. Your tool comes in, they're doing it, uh, allows them to do it much quicker, but it's different and it's it's a new way of doing business. And, and how do you approach getting people to adopt a new way of doing business? And in particular, how is it changing their jobs if now all of a sudden they don't have to take weeks or months to come to these decisions, they can do it in a day or less? Uh, how is that changing the industry? Uh, it's been it's been really interesting. I think, um, and and we're we come from the silks so who understand it. Scientists in particular uh, are are cynical about data, and they're cynical about trends and kind of algorithmically driven things. I think the way we've gotten around that in our first product, BD Live, is that we give them quant, but we're one click away from the document that is linked to that quantitative measure. And that's why having Tivio underneath is great because it's all you know search driven directly. You, know, you can go there through the ontologies and actually return the reference. So you get to join that qualitative experience of I read scientific papers, I know what's going on with this quantitative thing that kind of measures my intuition. And you know the experience with that culturally, there's a great <laughs> example. Of this. We were with a client, and we uh, we were given a number of assets they were evaluating. We had to come up with our evaluation of it. And they had already done theirs. So there's the moment where I slide my <laughs> data-driven answer across the table. And uh, they were looking to narrow it to four top ones. Now, we had two of the same that they had. So confirmed something for them with data, which I think is always good. And then two that were different. And one of the ones we demoted of theirs, we picked up something in the intellectual property, i.e., information they wouldn't have joined to their analysis yet. The lawyers would have done it a month later. We picked up something that you know would have saved them a month of BD time because they know, oh, that's not going to work. So example of a great downgrade. And then somebody, as they're staring at him, kind of slams his hand on the table and goes, I knew this one was good. <laughs> and one of the ones we promoted became, they rehashed the argument they had had before. So it was kind of like, quant is not the answer. But it is another evidence base where if you introduce it culturally as, you know, again, they could go talk to KOLs, knowledge leaders, they could go talk to the experts, but then add this as a secondary component, and culturally that tends to work. Also, being able to be transparent and get to document level is key to them understanding what that quant means. Right. So it's not a black box. It's, it right. allows them to drill down and really um, essentially test out the answers they're getting or they're, right. the advice they're getting from, from Relay. Um, and that, that's how they're going to ultimately grow the confidence in machine learning and you know these kinds of technical systems. I think Brigham made a great point. You, you put up a quant number, but then you let them see the documents. Think about that as a transitional state, right? Previously, you would have just surfaced the documents uh, for the talented analyst to consume and then you know draw the conclusion out. So putting some data, some structure around it, it just makes for a much smoother transition. It's it's a, a lot different than going from no data right to to having some data it's right. a much more subtle increase and uh, we, we've seen it a lot actually you know it's it's very challenging uh, we have some Intel clients and they are, they've been big on machine learning for a long time they've been looking across silos a, you know a long time that's been a goal for them but the challenge often is to when you suddenly start putting structure when they're used to having just surface the data for me as an analyst but as over time as they see hey this number is actually working or this you know whatever this recommendation right. is bringing me something that's letting me understand more uh, about you know how, how I make this decision, their own mental process changes. They realize, you know, I actually only look at the first four or five documents right. to assure myself. So now using this score, I can go down and see maybe a breakdown of the quartiles of documents and go in and look at some of the lower level documents, and that changes the way I, I use the data. And now I start to trust the number more. And then in time, right, we believe that you'll start to say, well, if the number's above 80, I don't even need to be involved, right? The analyst doesn't need to be there. The decision can be made automatically. Do you have the ability with your technology to drill down and discover the uh, the, the root source of um, 
of um, incorrect information. So can, can you kind of mine for uh, bad, bad information in, in, in these sort of diverse databases of unstructured data? Oh, yeah. I, could, you know, could I add a little bit to, to that? Um, how about the deliberate bad data of yeah, trying right. to yeah. manipulate uh, mm -hmm. the market, for example, um, ahead of time or using it to get a drug approved? Well, how, how, do you, how do you see that playing out and how do you, how do you accommodate that in your analysis? So, <laughs> you know, are you asking how long it'll take the market to respond to this data that we've now I, introduced? I think he was asking how to get out the criminals, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you hmm. one that um, I think is a focus and it gets brought up by all of our clients, which is, you know, uh, here, here's, a, here's a phrase I hear a lot. We don't believe uh, the publication literature. We think editorial process is flawed, or we right. think there's bias mm -hmm. at point X, Y, Z. You know, we can actually measure those things. We develop patterns to detect when there is a scientific controversy. So I'll give you a, a more recent example, uh, CTEP inhibitors. Okay, this is a, was supposed to be the follow-on to Lipitor. So Lipitor, a huge drug for the industry. CTEP was supposed to be the next drug, you know, and, and get all that revenue. Well, you know, there, the science isn't looking like it worked out. And there was a, a drug that failed. And it was interesting. There was the backlash to the failure, and there was the backlash to the backlash where, you know, the scientists said, no, 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 it was just that drug, everything else is still good. And you can actually see those waves in the data. And the thing we look at a lot, you know, uh, you mentioned velocity, Said, I mean, we're looking at multiple derivatives of stuff and trying mm -hmm. to detect when you see those pops and signal and, and those mean something. It's almost like if you see uh, A, then B, then C, you're more confident in F, right? You know, and it, it's actually transmitting that back to folks. So we spend a lot of time not just on, you know, hey, positive, affirmative stuff, but also, you know, what are the negative things? Uh, there's a, a project we're discussing with the FDA. Could we, uh, you know, fetter out um, adverse event profiles based on early data? So can we say this is what the mouse model data looked like? You know, what's the correlation of that to the potential, you know, a problem? And, and not just the data, but relate the whole ecosystem and, and see if we can detect those things. So, some exciting stuff there. And what about, you know, kind of helping uh, wade through all the false positives that might be out there, or, or, or data that's not, or insights that aren't really insights, maybe it's just noise. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how do you help your clients understand when something is really relevant and when it's not? Yeah, I mean, we right now spend a lot of time talking about what the market does. So detecting signals about when we have seen those controversies, what do they look like, and then look for common signals. Um, in the future, you know, dream of mine, you, you talk about scientific data, and, uh, and I gotta convince Sid to take in graph axes and you know, detect uh, statistical models you know, within figures. But um, long term, you could imagine coming up with your own model to measure that stuff and you know, seeking out certain aspects of it. Again, kind of hypothesis versus non-hypothesis. You know, targeting it that way, um, and, and I think that'll come. I mean, there, in the data transparency thing, and like we keep pointing up to the right, there's also going to be data complexity, mm -hmm. and as complexity is introduced, you're going to get um, more refined signals, or more important signals than you're getting just off kind of the basal noise. And so, uh, ability to deal with kind of complex data, I think, will also be really important. I think there will be a, a substantial change in investment in uh, sort of. It's like the, the analogy of fraud detection, right? There, there will be more data quality on unstructured data. People will become very interested in, uh, you know, understanding what does a misspelling mean? Is it deliberate, right? Or um, what if two entities are placed near each other a lot? which will be a, a, a typical uh, a approach to kind of throw some of these systems off on their biases. Well, one thing is, you know, getting good data sources and clean data sources, that's still important. Um, there's a reason people pay for data, right? They will pay Relay because Relay's data is really high quality and you have, you know, all kinds of checks and things that go on. When you go and harvest data, actually, especially when you harvest a lot of data, that can be one of the hardest things to, to do quality assurance on. There's so much of it. How would you even go and, and find you know, issues in the data? Um, we have a lot of different techniques you know, to bring to bear. Some of them work better in different industries. You know, uh, we have a client, a big manufacturer, who is essentially using indexing of documents to find documents that need need review and they have a whole series of special terms that they look for and if these appear in the documents then they review them and what they're finding is these documents should never have been put in the wild to begin with. Wild is you know, yeah. relative, right? But uh, some intranet. But that, you know, being able to say this is an example of a document that I don't want 
to be publicly available to all my employees or whatever or partners, you know, then being able to train the system to go find others like that. That's mm -hmm. one example. Finding you know um, essentially variant but repeated uh, uh, paragraphs for for uh, plagiarism detection. That's there's been a lot of work around things like that. Students are hating that. Absolutely, it's, it's, it's tough. So well, I, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I want to make sure that uh, anyone on in the uh, that's online has an opportunity to ask uh, questions. So let me pause here talking about big data, unstructured and structured data analysis. I wonder if um, I could ask a question. This is Dave Vellante. And um, Brigham, you mentioned the business user experience early on in your remarks. And, and I'm wondering how you help your end customers, the analysts, visualize all this data. Mm. No, and, and that is a tremendously important part of this. Um, you know, I, the users don't like to get a big text or CSV file to pour over. That's not what they're looking for. Um, in our UI, we took kind of two approaches. You know, we, we've used GWT and a, a number of apps there that are kind of really rapid for visualizing data off our back end. And always showing things temporally, I think, is crucial. You know, right now everybody gets kind of today's answer, but showing trends is a big part of it. And the second part that, that's really big, and we are working right now with both um, uh, Tableau and TIBCO Spotfire in our, in our front end in OEM. And we've been using them for the last six months ahead of our product launch in um, you know, uh, delivering actually deliverables and consulting and having our analysts actually work from that end. There's a couple of really uh, important parts to this. So number one, you're able to cut the data in any way you want beyond what you can do in Excel or you know anything like that. So it tends to blow away <laughs> these users just on that basis. But then there's this aspect of it that, it, again, combines quant with qual. So you can have a graph that's showing a temporal uh, thing on a given gene, for instance. And then right next to it, you can show the documents that are related to that. So it's kind of this experience of like, oh, it's going you know, up at a faster rate. Let me zoom in at that range and then see what happened there. You know, or what were the key things that might drive it that makes sense to me uh, from an understanding basis. The other part of this is that, and this is where one of the cru crucial things with uh, Ativio, and we're actually announcing uh, this week um, that we're a featured customer now of Tivico Spotfire, and we're doing a joint release with Ativio, where there's a crucial part where it's one thing to build a graph that's plugged to a database, relational or otherwise, and uh, those have been around for a while now. It's another thing to engage the user in an exploratory sense, to use their intuition and search to actually craft the quant. So I have uh, a, a dashboard right now where I'm looking at thought leaders, KOLs, and I can start with my ontologies and use ontologic search and say, all right, I want the best guy in anemia and on these two quantitative bases. And then I can add the ability to search the documents away to that person and say, okay, constrain it by um, you know, a certain type of mouse model that is common to research. So I can add a text string that's then limiting my people results by the documents that co-occur under that structure. And so instead of me a priori telling the user this is what's important, it gives them the ability to explore and then return documents and related information. So it's, it's giving kind of the, the, you know, the, the steering wheel to the user to drive quant which is great. A last really important part of this, and we started to touch on it, is the ability to do statistical modeling. Because at the end of the day with quant, a lot of users, particularly on a big decision, like um, this asset or that asset for M&A, you need to know how sure are we and when were we sure. And to do that, you really need to build in statistical inference into it. And for us right now, we built a layer with an open source product called R, but there's other packages we can integrate we have a kind of front to back stack where we have a Tivio's index on the bottom, R in between, and then Spotfire visualization on the front. So we're actually in real time doing statistical analysis of this quant, which is great because sometimes you get back, you know, like maybe we're not so sure about ophthalmology. You know, we're not, it's not that clear based on the data, but we're really confident about another area. And I think the last leap for big data and for people to turn over the keys to, like you said, the score, it, it's going to start with seeing documents and getting used to it, but ultimately it's going to be like, look, statistically, this is what's likely to happen, you know, and I'm this confident about it, and here's when I knew, you know, and, and, and I don't think, listen to this guy. Right, exactly. <laughs> this guy's wrong. Yes. So. I, I think it's a, you know, an amazing example of what unification does. Relay unifies information, they provide intelligence across it. Even think about the, you know, user interface, the experience of the business user. Brigham has used a lot of different terms, ontologies, search, dashboards, uh, reporting, visualization, graphs. 
That's what UI is all about. It's about creating intelligence off of all these different sources, all these different methods. It's not about one method. It's not, you know, search is not enough, BI is not enough. It's the collective. And I believe that this is very much the future of big data and data analysis is putting all the pieces together with, you know, that layer of brilliance and, and, and insight on top. So when you sit down with a CIO, what do you tell them? Uh, I say that uh, they should be looking immediately to use UIA on their next, on their strategic projects. Quite honestly, that's um, the best way to do it, right? When you have a project that requires you to integrate information and provide, you know, search and BI, analytics, dashboards, all of that experience on top of it, and maybe even workflow, and those are the apps that I think people are building now that matter, that capture the um, interaction with the user, it gets to a deeper level, it provides a, a greater quant and qual insight for the internal decision makers. Um, they have to start doing that right now uh, because gaining the expertise with it, getting the uh, infrastructure in place and learning what it takes to, and how easy it can be to merge a bunch of silos together and build an application on top of it. And how quickly and how low, the, how reduced the risk can be. You know, we didn't talk about that much, but one thing about Relay is they got to market faster because they didn't tr try and build the stack, right? They yep. took a stack and said, we're going to solve, we're going to build the app, and that's where we're going to put our effort and our uniqueness. And that's where their brilliance shines. Well, yeah. They might be brilliant open source developers, or they might be brilliant, brilliant you know, engineers, and they have all those folks, but that's not what that's about. It's Right. It's the collection. Uh, don't, don't let me, you know, no, words actually, around, actually, it's a very interesting point because one of the constraints that's sort of been thrown out is the lack of data scientists in order to do big data analytics. Uh, uh, to, to, are, are you saying that? Are you saying that a less sophisticated data analyst can drive more value for the company by using a particular set of tools that that make the experience easier, more understandable? I don't know if I'd say that they're a, a lesser analyst. I think they're all brilliant. You know, brilliant analysts are the are the audience at the end of the day, decision makers. the The point is, Relay's expertise is in knitting together. You know, this is my take: mm -hmm. knitting together and putting the intelligence on top of all the sources and all the technology. It's not implementing the individual technologies, and that, that's where I think yes, to a CI, I would say rather than going out and constructing your own UIA stack from you know Mega Vendor One here and some open source here, and you're going to knit it together, and then you're going to have to you know learn how to track these projects and keep up with the patch rates and all the things that go into building software. Maybe that's not your expertise, but you've got the analysts and the business, and if somebody else could help you put the information together and surface it, right? I, I keep using this line, surfacing the information for a ta talented analyst. At the end of the day, that's, if you can do that, right, then the, the focus is to interpretation. Is software, to a, is software as a service is, uh, the model for the future? David future? again. C can I push on that a little bit? I should ask a question of Brigham. Yeah. Um, it, you're, you're suggesting that the, the problem is uh, um, that you just provide uh, better tools for the, for the analysts. Uh, what about the analysts themselves and the education and the training that's required at both at two levels? Um, what advice would you give to the government in terms of what's required to, to really take advantage of this at one level? I mean, the, for example, uh, the, the amount of knowledge of Bayesian uh, statistics is not, is not exactly great uh, in the uh, country as a whole. And secondly, for a CIO, what advice would you give them uh, to develop the skills Required uh, for for the next uh, for the next decade. Yeah, well, from my perspective, well, I, I can tell you, I told all my younger cousins to switch majors to bioinformatics about five years ago, <laughs> um, and I I'm very I, my background on Wall Street is I covered among other things the genetic tools companies, and there's this uh, been this building technology around the human genome sequencing and thing out there's going to be a massive amount of data that requires the only way to get answers out of it is ontologies and then really sophisticated quant. And that could be hugely valuable to the healthcare system. So from a government perspective, what should you do? First of all, I believe you know everybody should get some level of statistical and biologic education. Maybe I'm biased to the biology, but certainly statistics beyond what's done today. I, I think you don't have to have an analyst that is a sophisticated Bayesian modeler if you have um, some of those tools out of the box. And I, I'm looking and paying attention to both what could potentially happen on SID's end, but also on TIBCO's end. And somebody is going to build this in where it's going to be uh, more intuitive. Um, you know, and, and just from the visualization side, those companies have taken leap one, you know, which is to be able to 
basically build cross tabs really easily, you know what I mean, and, and put them in a beautiful form. So I think there's going to be more out-of-the-box stuff available without having to be an advanced programmer or a stats guy. But from a government perspective, you need to, you know, have an understanding of, of how what that means and, and how to use it. I'm lucky enough to have been tortured by a stats professor in pharmacology, so that was where my kind of understanding of this originally came from. So uh, I guess he should be teaching more folks. On the second side from the CIO perspective, what would I tell a CIO? You know, when I, when I look at, and I've, I've talked with these groups because, you know, there's some interest obviously in them incorporating their own data into our analysis. And um, this is where there's a nice connection between Ativio and Relay. And they look at it like, well, we've got our internal silo and we want to match it to what you've got. You know, we have the scale and ability to do that. We could create a private instance. I mean, there's all kinds of, back to the Ativio choice, there's all kinds of reasons why that works for us. I think CIOs are trying to stay ahead of the data problems, but they're not that in touch with the actual people on the end of the phone making the decision. And those are our, those are our people. I mean, those are the ones we're trying to help. And just to prove my point, that you may have a CIO is investing in a major internal data architecture uh, movement and maybe even um, around BI specifically, he will have, let's say he has 50 users, 30 of them have SaaS subscriptions to something they don't really like. And maybe, and actually usually multiple. Not only that, they're using Google and they're using other search engines for specific data sources more often than not. So they may ask something of internal knowledge discovery to get like a report back, but they're not using it at their desk. That's just not happening. And there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, number one, they don't have access to the data internally in any kind of meaningful way. This is the structure side. You know, it's like combining that internal data in, in a meaningful and accessible way is problem one. I've seen, and as I'm sure you have, hmm. some really bizarre looking information <clears throat> architectures. And, you know, we know how these things evolved. You know, they evolved over time. There were mergers, there were different groups, whatever. The second side of it is, they don't know the tools to kind of really interact with. And this is more the Spotfire, Tableau side of the world. Pharma's unique because Spotfire in particular grew up in the bioinformatics world and got a big part of its start dealing with the scientists at a real low assay level. That's not the BI users. You know, they haven't ever, and they might know what it is, and they might have seen an interaction on its scientific data, but they haven't gotten there. I think lastly is then kind of connecting the dots and making meaningful analysis of it. And Right now, the analysts don't understand the information architecture well enough, and the information architecture guys at CIO don't know the questions. So that's why I feel for Relay and why we built the SaaS offering, because I think we can leap in there and help them out right yes. now. So it really boils down to a communication issue between yeah. business and IT, which we've, you know, we hear across right. IT segments. It's particularly important when you're talking about data analytics and uh, solving business problems with data. Right. Um, so so how, does, uh, how does the CIO go about kind of initiating you know, let's, let's take a CIO who understands the power of big data, uh, what it can do for their organization. How do they go about initiating uh, kind of that first project? Is it a technical problem? Do they need to identify the, uh, the business case first? I mean, how, how do you really get practically get started? And unfortunately, this is our last question, so make it a good answer. <laughs> okay, I'll do my best. Um, so I think number one, they've got to have a long view on, just like we did, about structuring data. So they've got to, you know, move to something which is going to be scalable and long term, still be in the game. I, you know, I think this is one of the, my concerns with the dupe, and I think Sid said it very well. I get the comment. It's like, yeah, it handles volume, but it doesn't handle analysis very well. And when we've architected considering a dupe, it's like, yeah, we may put certain data sets there if you know they're big chunky ones, but we'll deal with the summary reports you know, in our workflow for analysis. Right. The dupes are very powerful, but if it just becomes another silo, that doesn't That's solve right. the problem. That's exactly right. So I think they want to look to that long term. And then I think in the, in the kind of, uh, to help their users, they need to begin to consolidate and give them tools that actually deliver them answers. Now, you could give them all Spotfire subscriptions tomorrow, but I don't think that that would necessarily get them there. I think, uh, this is why Relay I think is really exciting. It's a SaaS offering but it has the potential to plug into their internal data. So it's almost like they can get the outside world organized by us. We give them the structure to answer the questions and the look and feel, and then strap in the know-how at Pharma X to that decision, um, you know, through a, an integration with, you know, an Ativio index or another data set that we can plug into. So I think you want to, don't try and boil the ocean as far as trying to come up with the answer because you don't know what's at those analyst desks and they don't know the problems you're facing. So you need to, in the meantime, focus on you know 
how do we kind of connect those dots? And I think there's some offerings here to do that. Brigham, thank you so much. Sid, thank you. I hope that you'll both uh, join us back here again uh, on a peer insight in the future uh, or, or at the Cube at uh, one of the many events with Silicon Angle TV. Um, I'm John MacArthur, Peer Insight Moderator here with Jeff Kelly, Wikibon's Big Data Analyst, uh, joined by Brigham Hyde, Adjunct Professor at Tufts University and Managing Director at Relay Technology Management, and Sid, Sid Probstein, CTO of Ativio. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, very helpful. We'll have uh, six um, uh, Peer Insight research notes up uh, on the uh, Wikibon site uh, in the next uh, couple of days. Feel free to jump in, edit, contribute, enhance, or provide another perspective on any of the analysis that we do, any of the, anything that we write. Uh, thanks again, John MacArthur, Peer Insight Moderator. Uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.